Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming uh, by way of introducing myself. My name is Miles Rappaport. I am currently the Senior Practice Fellow in American Democracy at the Ash Center of the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, the Ash Center runs a variety of exciting programs, including the series of which today's event is a part. Uh, that series is called Democracy, Justice, and the 2020 Elections. We've had a number of really good sessions up to now, and we'll probably go through up through January. Uh, I'm especially excited, I have to say, about today's event, uh, because in addition, before, long before I was an Ash Fellow, I had the honor of serving as Connecticut Secretary of the State, and I have immense respect for the role and the challenges that any Secretaries of State, particularly those who uh, monitor and, and oversee elections, uh, have. So I deeply appreciate all three of the Secretaries who are being with us this is a really busy time, just two weeks out from the event, uh, the big event. So let me just, before we start, make just a couple of quick announcements on behalf, behalf of the Ash Center. First, the Ash Center wants to acknowledge that the land on which Harvard sits is the traditional um, territory of the Massachusetts people uh, and has been a place that has long served as a meeting and exchange among nations. We also wanna take this opportunity to let the members of the Harvard community who are on the, on the call uh, know about the Harvard Votes Challenge, which is a nonpartisan initiative trying to build a civic culture here at Harvard by increasing voter registration and participation across the entire community. So we invite all uh, participants, and you can check the, the uh, chat, to join the movement at voteschallenge.harvard.edu. And I'll say to all of the uh, people who are on the, on the call that we encourage you to submit questions at any time throughout the presentation using the Q&A box to send them to us. And finally, to let you know that the event is being recorded and will be able to be found on the Ash Center website uh, on YouTube channel shortly after the event has concluded. Okay, so today is October 20th. We are exactly two weeks out from what everyone agrees, uh, for actually from what we used to call election day. The truth is the term itself is anachronistic. Uh, this year more than ever, November 3rd is in fact the culmination or more accurately the first culmination of a process of voting that has been going on for over a month at this point. As of today, according to the US Elections Project at Florida State University, over 35 million people have already voted, uh, either by mail or through in-person early voting. And to say that this year's process has been one of many challenges is to deeply understate the situation that we're in. But sometimes the rhetoric of the moment on all sides can hide a reality that is more, much more complex one in which local and county officials and secretaries of the state are working really hard every day to manage the challenges and put processes in place that will allow the election to go as smoothly and as efficiently as possible. Today we are, uh, today we are privileged to have three secretaries of the state, two Democrats and one Republican, who are running elections in three of the hardest fought battleground states in the country. I'm gonna ask them several opening questions uh, then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. And again, you should put them in the Q&A box. Um, and as we get close to the end of the hour, I'll close off the questions, come back to our panelists and let them each have a kind of a last word. Uh, first, we have Jocelyn Ben. Oh, by the way, they all have very long bios, which you can easily Google and find out. So I'm going to do the very short version. Uh, we have Jocelyn Benson, who is, is a graduate of Harvard Law School of 2004. We like to say that around here. Uh, she is Michigan's 43rd Secretary of the State. She is focused on ensuring elections are secure and accessible and improving customer experiences for all who interact with the Secretary of the State's office. She previously served as the Dean of Wayne State Law School. So welcome, Jocelyn. Uh, we're delighted to have you. Uh, Frank LaRose, who's the Secretary of the State of Ohio, uh, took office as Ohio's 51st Secretary of the State uh, not too long ago, January 14th, 2019. Prior to being elected as secretary, he served two terms, eight years in the state Senate representing the 27th district of Northeast Ohio. He served as chair of the transportation committee and chair of the commerce and workforce committee. Frank, thank you very much for making the time and being with us today. And lastly, we have Kathy Bookvar. Kathy has served as the secretary of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, as they say, um, since January 5th of 2019. In this role, she leads the department whose mission is to promote the integrity of the electoral process, support economic development through corporate filings and transactions, and to protect the health and safety of the public through professional licensing. 
Most recently, prior to being Secretary of the State, she served as Senior Advisor to the Governor of Pennsylvania, leading and managing initiatives to improve security and technology of Pennsylvania's elections. So we are among three people, all of whom know of where they speak. And let me ask the first question. Uh, and Jocelyn, we'll start with you. Uh, then we'll go right to Frank and then to Kathy. Uh, so the first question is, this has been about as extraordinary and challenging an election cycle as any of us can remember. Because of the critical role you play in your state's elections and because of the critical role your states play in the national election and the presidential election, you have been in the epicenter of activity and under a microscope. Uh, what would you say are the biggest challenges you faced and are facing now two weeks out from election day? Jocelyn? Uh, well, thanks, uh, Miles, for having me here. And, you know, I, I'm going to answer real quick, but I just want to say the fact that you've got three secretaries of state from three critical swing states uh, to spend some time here talking with you in the last two weeks uh, until the polls close really speaks to your extraordinary, um, um, the extraordinary respect that we have for you and your work uh, and your ability to kind of bring us all together at this really uh, considerably challenging moment in our each of our, our work schedules. So, um, mm -hmm. so you know, we're glad to be here and, and really, you know, glad to be here at, at, and, and working with you and, and, and grateful for all you've given for our democracy. Uh, now, in my view, and, and you know this, Miles, I, I wrote a book on uh, Secretary of State role in 2008, talking about how secretaries serve as guardians of the democratic process. And really, we're seeing that underscored this year. And we look at the challenges leading up to Election Day. In my view, the biggest challenge is the issue of election interference uh, and interference in a, in a way that would seek to sow seeds of doubt among our electorate, among our voters about the integrity of the process and as a way of undermining their faith that the results of the elections will be an accurate reflection of the will of the people. Now that can come from various different ways, but as secretaries, we really are standing guard, as I mentioned, over that process around to protect the, our voters. And in Michigan in particular, that's come up in three ways. Certainly you're, here, you're gonna hear a lot about the, the term misinformation and disinformation, efforts to confuse voters about their rights, particularly at a time when there's facing so much confusion and anxiety about so many things. We've worked to give citizens clarity about their right to vote this year and our success in that is reflected in the enormous number of citizens who are voting early uh, and who are on track to vote uh, this fall in Michigan. Uh, a second element of that though, of protecting against election interference and the challenge therein is protecting voters' health uh, and safety uh, in this very uh, uh, challenging political environment. For us, that's meant ensuring people know they can vote from home in the midst of a pandemic, ensuring people know if they vote in person on election day, they'll be met with election workers wearing masks, gloves, and sneeze guards, and that all the CDC guidelines to protect the health of our workers and our voters will be in place at a poll polling places on election day. And then third, that also means protecting uh, our voters against efforts to intimidate them, to protect them from threats and harassment, particularly at the polls, but also in our absentee county boards and at our clerk's office as well. And one of the things we've done, of course, to prepare for that challenge in particular, as you know, uh, is to ban the open carry of firearms in polling places on election day, which uh, under my authority as the chief election officer for the state of Michigan, uh, we, we feel is well grounded in the law. So all that said, you know, the bottom line is challenges are great. We're prepared to meet them. And I think you'll hear the same from my colleagues as well. Great. Thanks, Jocelyn. Uh, great way to start. Uh, Frank? Well, I'm going to reiterate many of the things that my friend from the, that state up north, as we lovingly call our friends from Michigan, had to say. But here in Ohio, we started uh, really in the spring identifying some of the key metrics that we wanted to hit. One of the first ones was poll worker recruitment. I'm happy to report that we've had actually great success with that. Uh, we've told our boards of elections that they have to recruit 150% of their normal allocation. And so, for example, if your county normally needs 1,000 poll workers, we really want to have 1,500 trained and ready to go for election day uh, this year. And so uh, in that regard, we have now exceeded that number that we needed in most counties. And, and we're going to be ready to go to make sure that each county has the number of poll workers they needed. And that's been a big effort. Of course, the health scenario, uh, again, is something that we have put particular attention on. We worked with the experts from the CDC, as well as the Ohio Department of Health. We issued a 61 point checklist that each county board of elections is required to follow. And of course, we um, were able to mobilize massive quantities 
of uh, personal protective equipment to make sure that all of our boards of elections are well prepared with everything that they need. We've seen donations from companies. Uh, and of course, we've expended some of our federal CARES Act dollars for that purpose as well. Uh, one of the next things that we focused on is really trying to maximize participation in early and absentee voting. And in, in this regard, uh, I couldn't be happier with the success that we've had. Uh, we're on track already to have two times the previous amount of absentee voting in the state of Ohio, where well over 2.5 million Ohioans have already requested their empty ballots. In fact, new numbers on that are going to be coming out here just uh, in the next few hours. And we've already had uh, uh, three times the number of people participating in early voting. And so that's great to see. And so we've been successful at really helping take the pressure off of election day because we don't want to see any kind of lines or crowding on election day and by encouraging absentee voting in a few key ways that we've been able to do so in early voting, uh, we've been successful in that regard. I also uh, wanna mention uh, this effort to make sure that voters have accurate information. It is unfortunate, but it's a reality that we live with, that whether it's coming from foreign adversaries or whether it's coming from our own domestic uh, related uh, American politicians, there's a lot of disinformation and misinformation out there swirling around. Uh, one of the roles that we take on as the chief elections officers for our states is to make sure that we're that source of accurate information that we push back uh, when there are false narratives that are circulating out there and make sure that people have the accurate information that they need in order to be an informed voter. And, uh, you know, I couldn't be happier with the success that we've had so far, and, and we're going to keep charging all the way through Election Day. Great. Thanks very much, Frank. Uh, Kathy, over to you. You'll hear, hear a lot of uh, similar messaging here as well. So, and thank you again, Miles, for hosting us here today and these important issues. So, you know, I think disinformation, misinformation, um, single, single most uh, biggest challenge that we've been facing across Commonwealth, across the country. And it's, you know, it's something that, uh, you know, I think secretaries of state election officials have had to deal with for a long time. It's just the 24 seven news cycle, the social media, the, the, how too easy it is to retweet or repost um, is, has just really worsened that. And so, you know, I feel like we are, we are constantly trying to make sure that just like Frank said and Jocelyn said, Trusted Info 2020, really encouraging uh, voters and you know, officials and electeds to really not repeat misinformation, to make sure that they're checking to make sure that the information that they're reading is accurate. And you know, that sort of goes then hand in hand. So one of the things, as you, I'm sure you know, in Pennsylvania, we have seen more change to how Pennsylvanians vote, how elections are run in Pennsylvania in the last year and a half than we've seen in the last century in, in Pennsylvania. And those are good things. And I know we're gonna talk some about those in some of, I think the follow-up questions here, but I do wanna say, you know, sort of what, these are great changes by and large, but change also presents its own challenges, right? And you combine sort of the, infra so Pennsylvanians now, you know, for the first time can vote by mail for any reason or no reason at all. We've got, you know, we, we actually, you know, extended our voter registration deadline. And I'm happy to say that, you know, at least in part because we extended our deadline, we are at an all time high in voter registration in Pennsylvania. But there's all these new things. We've got new voting systems in, across every uh, county in the Commonwealth. Um, and so, you know, all with voter verifiable paper trails, again, good things, but they're changed, right? So you combine new things with lots of different disinformation. And not only are you needing to provide a base level of information, but you're having to counteract the disinformation and misinformation that's out there. So, you know, we thank goodness, you know, we've had between the federal dollars, CARES Act and the um, HAVA dollars earlier, as well as the, you know, support of private foundations, um, we were able to do a lot when it comes to voter education. And we've had um, and, you know, again, I, I apologize because I'm probably getting into other things that you're going to want to talk about in future questions, but do, we're doing a bilingual TV, radio, um, mail, digital, email, text, communication, public education campaign to make sure that we reach as many of the over 9 million Pennsylvania voters that we now have registered to vote and beyond. So um, I'll stop there, Miles. I know we've got a lot more to talk about, but those are kind of the overview issues. 
All right. Well, it's interesting. There is absolutely a real consistency in what the three of you are saying, both about what the challenges are and what you've, uh, you know, what you've tried to do uh, against it. And I've been thinking, Kathy, as you said, that public education is just essential in this kind of changing environment. So the, obviously the, you know, one of the biggest issues has been the, the question of mail-in voting and how have you handled it. So uh, let me just ask you about that because it's all, it's affecting all of you. Um, so we'll go there and then I have uh, one more follow-up. We'll, we're already like got 10, a dozen uh, questions in the chat room. So we'll get to those as soon as we can. But uh, 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 Kathy, let me start with you uh, in terms of the, the mail-in. So obviously you were, you know, the subject of a court a case that got decided by the Supreme Court uh, this morning. Um, so you've been right in the middle of the headlines on it, but uh, how do you think the mail-in voting is process is working and how do, what are you doing to make sure it really works? Thanks, Miles. It, it's, it's unbelievable the way Pennsylvanians are engaging this. And not only do we have you know, vote by mail, but now we have early in-person vote by mail in effect. So it's early voting. And Pennsylvanians have just been embracing both of these options. And it's literally the first time. Um, so you know, as you may know, you know, in the primary, we went from, in the 2016 primary, 84,000 Pennsylvanians had voted absentee, 84,000. And the 2020 primary, we ended up with nearly 1.5 million Pennsylvanians who voted by mail, 17 times as many as in the prior presidential. So, right, so it's actually easier to go from 1.5 million to 3 million, which is about where we're going to end up. We already have over 2.8 million uh, applications that have been approved, you know, just under 2.8 million applications that are in the mail to voters, um, and over a, somewhere between a million and 1.5 million Pennsylvanians have already cast their ballot two weeks ahead of election day. And like just for the, the exact comparator, in the 2016 presidential election, a total of 300,000-ish uh, voters voted absentee. So we are already so far beyond anything like that, you know, with two weeks to go. So it's going great. And I'm thrilled with the fact that we've been able to reach so many voters on this. Um, the court cases, of course, have been a continuing challenge. I'm happy to say that we've been, thankfully, uh, really just keep getting, we've, we've been sued in a lot of different courts. And by and large, each one of those courts has been supporting our guidance from the Department of State to the counties, our interpretations of the law, and largely have been on the side of the voters. So I have to say, I'm thankful for that the US Supreme Court issued its decision yesterday and declined to overturn the, you know, the request for a stay uh, that was, or declined to grant the stay that was requested uh, in the, to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court's decision, which allows us, um, to, so of course, every ballot needs to be count, cast by November 3rd, but in Pennsylvania, they could be counted so long as they're received by the counties by the Friday after the 3rd, so the 6th, by 5 p.m. on the 6th. So as of now, that, that, that standard stays. I think that, that I pushed for that three-day extension um, as opposed to the seven days that were being requested by others because I thought the three days really found that balance between giving voters access, but also uh, effective election administration and making sure that the counties had time to canvas those ballots and promptly. So it was a good balance. I'm really happy you know, that we're still there um, and you know, we'll keep pushing for uh, the voters. to. And we have one more week till the deadline for voters. To, so I'm gonna tell every voter, don't wait till the end. Doesn't matter what the Supreme Court held. I want you to apply today. Go to votespa.com, apply today, get your ballot in as soon as you receive it, do not wait. Thanks, Miles. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you don't sound that worried, which is uh, highly encouraging. Uh, Frank, how about you? You've had your, uh, 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 you know, a huge number of mail-in ballots, and how do you feel like it's going, and uh, what's happening there? You know, it's going quite well. Here in Ohio, we have a history of, of running absentee voting really for a long time. We've had close to two decades of, of doing this, and uh, our boards of elections do it at a decentralized local level. Uh, you know, we've had a few errors that have come up where, for example, a vendor has overpromised and underdelivered. 
thankfully, uh, the boards of elections have been able to work with those vendors that uh, that made mistakes and, and get those kind of things resolved. And thankfully, because Ohio has four weeks of absentee voting, and because those errors happened at the very beginning, there was time to get those corrected. But we started early on encouraging absentee voting in Ohio. We sent out one of these, that absentee ballot request form that we sent to all 8 million of Ohio's registered voters, and we've seen them respond. In fact, I in fact, just got new numbers from my team. As of now, 2.7 million Ohioans have already requested their absentee ballot. The boards of elections have fulfilled those requests, and, uh, and we're happy to see it. We knew that we were going to see more first-time absentee voters this year than we've ever seen before, and so we worked to make the process a lot more user-friendly. Uh, we redesigned the envelopes so that they move more efficiently through the postal system. We redesigned the the uh, the identification envelope that you have to fill out with your with your identification information, and also redesigned the instruction form uh, that came with the absentee ballot to make it a lot more accessible and easy to understand for Ohio's voters. And I believe that that's paying dividends. We've also instructed our boards of elections instead of sort of just relying on the old snail mail method of notifying someone when they did make a mistake on the form, they're now being directed to pick up the phone and call them or get on the email and to send an email to the voter to start that process of fixing any errors. I think we all know that one of the most common errors is that somebody will forget to sign it or, or they'll put today's date instead of their date of birth. And so when those kind of errors occur, the boards of elections have been instructed to work with the voters to get those corrected. Uh, also happy to say that here in Ohio, we have 10 days for our ballots to arrive at our Board of Elections. That's something that has been longstanding law in the state of Ohio. So as long as that ballot is postmarked by Monday, November 2nd, it can arrive up until the 13th of November. And so that allows ample time. Of course, we don't want people to procrastinate and wait all the way until uh, November 2nd. But if they do wait until November 2nd, it has 13 day, it has 10 days to arrive up until November 13th. And so plenty of time. And I'm actually happy to say that um, the Postal Service has been exceeding expectations, at least in the first two weeks of absentee voting in Ohio. Uh, we've seen them uh, delivering at a very rapid pace, and we're happy to see that uh, because, candidly, myself and Secretary Benson and Secretary Buckfar and several of the others uh, got on the phone and, 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 and held the, uh, the Postal Service accountable to actually make some important changes. Uh, I believe those changes are working, and, and we're going to keep holding them accountable to make sure that they continue to deliver for the people of Ohio. We're proud of the fact that the uh, the Brookings Institute ranked Ohio's absentee voting system among the top in the nation. That's something that we're really happy about. Now, here's the, the bad news. Unfortunately, because again, there's been so much noise out there, uh, whether it's from the right or from the left, uh, that has caused people to, in some cases, lose trust in the postal service or to believe this mythology about sort of widespread voter fraud and, and some of these other things that unfortunately people have taken to heart. We've seen you know, large numbers of Ohioans that don't trust the mail now and feel that they have to drive to their board of elections to submit their absentee ballot. That's certainly not the case. And I'm trying to remind Ohioans that just like my wife and I did, the best way to return your absentee ballot is of course, to put it in the mail and then go on, on, on our online tracking system and track it to make sure it's been received by your board of elections. Of course, if you do decide to take it to your board of elections and you want to personally deliver it, Ohio's law allows you to do that, and we've made that more convenient than ever as well uh, with now providing a 24-7 drop-off uh, location at every county board of elections, a secure box that anybody can use any, any time of the day or night uh, from now through election day. And so uh, we're proud of the absentee voting system we have in Ohio, and Ohioans are using it in record numbers. Right. Frank, I do need, obviously, to ask you a follow-up question on it, because, and I, there are probably a, a half a dozen questions about the issue of only one drop box per county. You know, this has been in the headlines. You've gotten your fair share of uh, criticism about it. It's gone back and forth in the courts. So uh, I want to make sure I give you a chance to say, why are you only having one drop box per county? Well, first of all, let's start with what the law says in Ohio. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I, I've got some great ones that work with me. Uh, but Section 35, Title 35 of the Ohio Revised Code, 3509.05, specifically says that there are three ways you can return your absentee ballot. What it says is that you can mail it, which is obviously the most common way and the way historically Ohioans have returned their absentee ballot. It says that you can personally deliver it to the director of the Board of Elections, or you can have a family member personally deliver it to the director of the Board of Elections. The plain reading of that uh, from our standpoint is that you have to take it to the Board of Elections. Now, would I like to see uh, a further expansion of the Dropbox program in Ohio? Sure. And I've said that on many occasions, but the place to do that is not at the courthouse, it's at the state house, and that's a change that should have been made a long time ago. Thankfully, when the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals here in Ohio uh, heard that uh, the the the, uh, the the case recently, 
uh, they, they stayed the lower court's ruling because they recognize the importance of stability and not making last minute changes. It's the Purcell principle that you just shouldn't be changing things up at the last minute. Certainly after early voting has already begun, it's far too late to make a potentially disruptive and confusing change like that. And again, there's been a lot of noise made by some folks that have caused people to have an irrational fear of trusting the mail. Uh, people should mail in their absentee ballots. It's the best way to send in their absentee ballot. It's still the most convenient way. And then you can track it again by going to the website and making sure that it's received. Again, I, I've told our, our state legislative leadership that we should work on a bill next year to, uh, to look at uh, clarifying this issue. And I would be very supportive of that. But of course, making last minute changes like that would be deeply irresponsible. And that's why we're not doing that here in Ohio. All right. All right. I'll leave it there for now. Uh, Jocelyn, you know, I want to, I want to shift a little bit because you already talked to, uh, some about the, your, all the work you're doing on mail-in. Uh, Michigan has seemed to be sort of the epicenter of concerns about um, voter intimidation, the possibility even of violence. You know, we saw the armed uh, people at the Michigan State House. Uh, we know that you have actually said uh, banned, uh, you know, um, um, firearms from the polling places under your oh, responsibility. So, um, so tell us what you uh, what do you think about all this, and uh, how concerned are you? How concerned we should we all be that uh, there are going to be these issues are going to come up in Michigan on election day? Well, I, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that. I do want to. Well, hopefully, we can come back to the actually the, the mail in voting issue in Michigan because there's a lot of unique things about our state uh, that are a little bit different than Pennsylvania and Ohio that we haven't talked about uh, and. Um, so hopefully we can come back to that, but I'm happy to shift and and talk about our work in uh, in Michigan to also protect voter safety on election day. Now we do anticipate that two thirds of our citizens we're already seeing. We announced today three million citizens have uh, ex expressed and requested a ballot to vote early. Um, so just a little nudge at my friend Secretary LaRose. You may know we have a bet about which state is going to have higher turnout. The loser has to sing the opposing team's fight song at the next Michigan Ohio State football game, or whenever that may be. Hopefully in December. Uh, so that said, we're at three million. We're um, anticipating even more in the weeks ahead. Uh, but we will also have millions of citizens voting in person on election day, and it's really important recognizing the, uh, um, as you mentioned, Miles, the. Uh, challenging environment uh, and the threats to our lawmakers, our governor, uh, state officials, uh, and the burden that has placed on our law enforcement, as well as the stresses that it's put our voters under, uh, that, that I, as the state's chief election officer, have a responsibility, as I mentioned earlier, to ensure every voter feels secure and safe regardless of how they choose to vote, whether they choose to vote early through the mail or returning their ballot at one of our over a thousand local drop boxes throughout the state of Michigan, voting early at their clerk's office or voting in person on election day. So on election day itself, we wanna ensure, and this became something that local clerks uh, and voters asked for, that we provided clarity uh, about what was voter intimidation and threats and harassment at the polls. And we view, I view uh, that uh, the open carry of firearms to be both visually and in other ways, potential threat uh, or potentially intimidating or potentially voter harassment uh, in the polls on election day. Now, we also don't allow campaigning, political campaigning in the polls or with 100 feet of the elections. So you know, in many ways, there is a significant legal precedent that quite soundly not only provides my role as the chief election officer is the ability to make guidelines to protect the health and safety of our voters, as well as to uh, manage uh, precincts on election day. But on top of that, protect our voters' fundamental right to vote, which they have is enshrined in our state and our federal constitution. And also, of course, to enforce or protect voters against uh, intimidation, threats, or harassment, which, as you know, is also illegal under state and federal law. Uh, so with that, we feel very grounded in the law and, um, and focused on protecting every voter and sending a message to every voter throughout the state of Michigan, regardless of where they are, in partnership with the Attorney General and Michigan State Police, they will be protected on election day. They do not have to worry about risking their health or their safety if they do choose to vote in person and will be there uh, with clear guidance as we've established uh, to protect our voters against any form of harassment, intimidation, or threats. Okay, great, thank you. And I'm actually gonna take a question. So we're moving to questions from the audience and the first one is gonna give you a chance to go back to the mail-in ballots, Jocelyn. Okay. 
John Ward at Yahoo News said, says, how long do you think it will take you to have the mail ballots counted now that you have a day before election day to process? And uh, okay, that's the question to you. And then there's one, uh, the parallel, I'm missing it, uh, to uh, Secretary Bookvar, how long do you expect your process to take since the legislature has not allowed you any time before election day to pre-canvas mail ballots? Uh, Jocelyn, first to you and then- Yeah, Kathy. I'm happy to take that, Miles. And, and notably, and this is what I wanted to talk about earlier, um, Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania all have very unique aspects of our voting laws, as, we, as you know. In Michigan, voters themselves amended our state constitution to give themselves a right to vote by mail. Uh, and also in Michigan, ballots must be received by 8 p.m. on election day. Uh, so it's a little bit different than Pennsylvania, and it's a little bit different than Ohio. And we also have a difference, uh, particularly with vis-a-vis -vis Ohio, uh, with regards to when we can begin tabulating ballots that were voted early. Uh, now, uh, in um, as was mentioned, um, well, let me just take a step back and say that in our August statewide primary, 1.6 million citizens voted early. It took about 40 hours statewide for our election officials beginning at 7 a.m. on election day to open and tabulate each of those ballots. So based on that pure math alone, and as I've said many times, I'm a, I'm a data person. I just look at the math and try to make uh, predictions and, and, uh, ex and set our expectations from there. Based on that, it's gonna take 80 hours to process and tabulate twice as many, 3.2 million ballots, which we're on track to see or perhaps even exceed this November. Uh, so if we're talking 80 hours, that takes us into from 7 a.m. on election day until about Friday. Now we've done a number of things uh, to change and increase capacity since our August primary. We've, we've doubled and in some places even tripled the number of high-speed ballot tabulators in place uh, to ensure even increased efficiency in processing and tabulating those ballots. We've recruited over 30,000 election workers who will be working working the polls and precincts and in absentee counting boards on election day. So we've increased our efficiencies, our people, our bipartisan oversight and our machines. And the legislature has given some communities, 53 of our 1500, uh, the ability to begin uh, opening ballots and preparing them for tabulation in 10 hours on Monday prior to election day. We anticipate uh, that that's gonna save us about three hours total. So we're still kind of estimating because a lot can happen as you know, as we all know, in between when the polls close and when the results are announced, we're still setting expectations for our full tabulation to be complete by Friday of election week. But throughout that time, from the moment the polls close until we announce that final tabulation, I'll be consistently updating the public in every way possible, even doing press conferences from our absentee counting board facilities to demonstrate to the public exactly what's happening, exactly how the process is working so that they can have full confidence that a full tabulation securely and effectively and accurately of every ballot is taking place. And the minute we're able to re release results from different communities, we're gonna be doing that to keep again, the public informed every step of the way of how much more we need to go and how far along we are in the process. Great. Now, I think the, uh, you know, the, the issue has come up many, many times about finding trusted messengers of information when there will be lots and lots of information out there. So I think, you know, having you, uh, you three and other secretaries of states be that for your state in a, in a proactive way seems like a really important thing. Kathy, how about you in the counting of absentee ballots? Yeah. So, um, you know, we are, uh, Pennsylvania is unfortunately one of four states, I understand, in the entire country whose legislatures has not allowed uh, the counties to start pre-canvassing the ballots before Election Day. Uh, we've been working really hard to try to make that happen, but at this point, I'm not optimistic that it will. Um, so luckily, the counties are doing a phenomenal job. And you know, really from the moment that the ballots in the primary were done being counted, we, the counties moved on to preparing for the general and we worked with them to, you know, for them to up their staffing, up their equipment, best practices, timelines that they should expect, working with outside experts in these areas, as well as, you know, of course, the voting system vendors and others to figure out what was most important, where we could eliminate bottlenecks. Um, and, it, and it's been tremendously productive. So, you know, all the counties have really up their game on all of those things. And on top of that, I mean, and this just really tells you, shows you the dedication and commitment of the county election officials. A lot of the counties and really all of the largest counties are planning to count 24 seven until the count is done. And I would wish that of nobody. I mean, they are already 
going to have had so much to be doing, but that's how committed they are. They're going to have teams, people counting these ballots. So I expect the overwhelming majority of ballots, you know, certainly received before, on or before election day to be counted within a matter of days. So, you know, by Friday, I think the overwhelming majority of ballots will be counted in Pennsylvania. Uh, now, having said that, we all know that overseas and military ballots, of course, have another week to be counted. You know, we've got the three days from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. So that and provisional ballots take longer, but the overwhelming majority of mail and regular in-person ballots uh, should be counted within a matter of days. Great. Uh, Frank, how about how about in Ohio? What's your what's your sense about when you'll be able to complete the count? Well, thankfully in Ohio, uh, again, probably because we've been doing this for again close to twenty years, we've got in place a really good set of laws and procedures as it relates to this. We have uh, the ability to begin processing those absentee ballots as soon as they arrive, and so as we speak right now, county boards of elections are slicing open envelopes, proofing the identification information, checking the signature against the signature on file working with the voter if they made a mistake, uh, which is key as well to allow them maximum time to correct those mistakes, for example, on their identification envelope. And they can even scan them and have them all ready to go. So right at 731 on election night, when the polls close, the boards of elections will begin the tabulation. And, and really the first results that we report, when you start to see results at 745 or 8 or 830 at night, those are going to be those absentee votes. Those are among the first ones that are counted because if you think about it, the ones coming in from the precincts are still in the car uh, being driven down to the Board of Elections. And so uh, we're going to have a very early report of absentee votes, but that doesn't mean uh, that it won't go into the wee hours of, of uh, Wednesday morning. For example, if the Boards of Elections receive a large quantity of absentee ballots that arrive on Election Day, then they'll have to cut all those open, proof them, and, and get those tabulated as well. So again, it could go late into Tuesday night or early into Wednesday morning. Now, here's the key thing, though that we're doing to really make it clear the difference between the election night, uh, that unofficial canvas on election night and the final certified result that comes a week later, weeks later. We've changed our election night reporting website to really highlight the number of outstanding absentee ballots. It's a knowable number. It's just never been highlighted in the past because generally the number of outstanding ballots is not high enough uh, to you know, change the outcome of the race after that unofficial canvas is completed on election night. And so this year, we're going to highlight the difference between the ballots that went out, the ballots that came in, and that gives, uh, whether it's a reporter or a candidate, uh, it gives them uh, accurate information, a voter for that matter, looking at the website to know whether that election night result that they're seeing is likely to be conclusive or whether we need to wait longer to figure out who's going to be the winner in Ohio. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I think that, you know, one of the messages that I think is being, uh, you know, effectively sent is that not to expect, uh, you know, election results on that night, you know, whether for whatever the networks are, whatever, not to sort of build that expectation that any moment we're going to know who the victors are in the state. You need time to, to do it and do it right. And I think that's, uh, that's what I'm hearing from all of you. I do want to, there, I'm, I'm looking, we have uh, 30 some odd questions already, but uh, I'm, so I'm trying to group them. But there is, there are several that are about a, a concern that I think a lot of people are worried about. And that is the, the period right after the election. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, being partisan when I say that the, you know, the issues that President Trump has raised about not necessarily accepting the results um, worries that other people have about flurries of litigation that will make it uh, uh, complicated. The, even the possibility has been raised that some state legislatures will attempt to simply name a set of electors, you know, taking advantage of the fact that there's, there's controversy about the results. What, are, what role do you think that you will play and can play to kind of make sure that uh, the elections are not the, the mistrust and the, and, the, and the false flags of election uh, chaos, uh, don't overwhelm us. Uh, Frank, I think I'll start with you on that one. Yeah, I think that uh, some of the most important things as it relates to that come before the election, and that's maintaining the, uh, the transparency of the way that the office is run, working with our county boards of elections to make sure that they're doing the same, and also working to maintain the stability and the predictability of our system of elections. Again, that's why it's a long-held principle that making last-minute changes, whether it's a result of a partisan lawsuit or, or just a bright idea that somebody has at the last minute, that's, that's not generally a smart thing to do because that can become the pretext for that post-election lawsuit. Uh, but also, again, doing things in that bipartisan, transparent way that have always been the way that, that you should run elections. And that's 
clearly the way that we're operating here in Ohio. That's the way that our boards of elections are operating. And uh, again, when they just look at, for example, the transparency of disclosing that number of outstanding absentee ballots, anybody that calls a victory, let's say that your favorite candidate's ahead by 100,000 votes and there's still 200,000 outstanding absentee, you would look ridiculous for declaring victory under those circumstances because by definition, the contest isn't over yet. And so it's that kind of transparency that helps people to be fully informed about this going forward. Okay. Kathy, what are your thoughts on this question? And since yeah, Pennsylvania I mean, is often uh, cited as the place that might be the uh, epicenter of confusion and, uh, and, and conflict. You know, again, then that goes to change. I agree with Frank. I mean, one of the things that we did it, or we're doing is, uh, the, so our website, our, you know, our, our election night returns website is going to divide the ballots, same as Frank. I mean, we, you know, again, you know, our high was somewhere around 300,000 absentee ballots before. And now we're looking at, you know, it could be 3 million or it certainly looks like it's gonna be between 2.5 and three at minimum. And so, um, so we're gonna tr break it up. So it's gonna show in-person voting, uh, mail-in and absentee voting and provisional ballot voting. And then we also have been tracking broken down by county, how many ballots have been mailed out, how many ballots have been cast and we'll continue throughout the, the night and the day um, to show not just what's been counted, but what's outstanding on e each of those fronts. And so I think that that piece of it, and combined with, as I said, some of the counties are planning on counting 24 seven. So it's not like, you know, you go to sleep at 2 a.m. and there's nothing until 8 a.m. There's, there's gonna be a continuous flow of updates. We also, at the Department of State, are gonna have regular check-ins throughout the entire night with each of the counties to make sure that we are getting the updates on all that information as quickly as possible. And then we're gonna have that same transparency with the public, with the press and everybody else to constantly be sharing that information as often as we can. Um, and you know, even starting now, I mean, I've been doing twice weekly press conferences. I'm going to three times, at least three times a week press conferences next week. And, you know, hope, you know, I don't know how long it's going to have to last, but the idea, I want to give as much information constantly and answer questions of the press and the public as often as possible. So look, the lawsuits, the lawyers are going to be doing what the lawyers do. We're going to have some of the best legal minds dealing with this. I, I have been trying to get the lawsuits out of the way the issues decided now so that we didn't have any questions left on election day. Um, but I've been the defendant in the overwhelming majority of lawsuits and there's only, there's only so much I can control those. But the idea we've been moving towards is getting as much decided ahead of time so that there's no questions left on election day. Um, so that's really, and, you know, I have to say the, I, I talked about the commitment and dedication of the county election officials, but the same goes for my team here at the Department of State. I mean, these are some of the most incredibly dedicated public servants I've ever had the opportunity to work with in my life. And they, like all of us are committed, by the way, I just wanna say this, we will, we will fight to the end to make sure that the will of the people, that the voters get to decide who is elected on November 3rd and the days following, um, that is the role of the people, that is the role of the voters, and I will oppose any attempt, whether it's by legislators, whether it's by litigation, to take that away from the people. So that commitment is there, and I will fight to the end to make sure that that happens. Jocelyn, that's, let's, let's, yeah, what's well, your perspective on all this? Let's hear it. Yeah, I mean, certainly what um, Secretary Bookfar just said really reflects the commitment all of us as secretaries have, ha have to ensure that the will of the people is what drives uh, who has power uh, in our country and in our states and even at the local level. That's why we serve as guardians of the democratic process. I think as we look towards uh, you know, running uh, and preparing and finalizing and closing the polls and, and everything that's gonna follow, uh, to me, it's all about preparation for every potential contingency. That's how we've succeeded thus far in Michigan to be holding and managing. This is our fourth 
uh, election, each having record breaking turnout, record numbers of people voting early in the midst of a pandemic. We've succeeded through preparation and preparing for every contingency. And on election night in the days that follow, that preparation comes in three forms or will be reflected in uh, three ways. One, uh, accessibility, two, transparency, and three, responsiveness, uh, which is what you, I think, hearing from my colleagues as well, making sure that we are on hand to answer every question, to debunk every myth, to respond uh, and to uh, obliterate any attempts to misinform the public about what's happening, uh, to be fully transparent about the process that's happening, uh, to uh, you know, show the public, the nation, uh, what is happening in Michigan and in all of our states, uh, to count every vote and ensure every vote is counted, and then to be responsive to any efforts by any candidate to claim victory uh, prior to a full tabulation of the ballots in our states or others, uh, to be very clear that it's the will of the people that will decide who has power in our country. It's the way democracy works. Uh, and I think what you're gonna see from secretaries of state all around the country, including the three of us, is our willingness to stand and use the platforms that we've been given uh, to drive that home, to be the voices on behalf of the people, on behalf of democracy that protects every vote and ensures every voice is heard. Great, thanks. Thank you, all of you. Listen, um, I, uh, you know, I want to apologize. There are many, many uh, questions in the chat. Some of them are very specific and very narrow. So uh, I want to try to keep it broad. But one of the questions that, that have come from a number of people is a little bit looking forward and uh, beyond uh, the election of 2020, although it's hard to get there right now. But uh, uh, the Ash Center is going to be holding an event probably in January, which is going to focus on the issue of what did we learn from the 2020 elections and the, you know, and what should we be thinking about for the future? What agenda does that suggest for the future? So I know all of you, uh, Frank, you actually mentioned this about, you know, what you might be thinking about proposing later, but so if you, if you think about what changes in the election process would you like to see based on what you have seen and heard and experienced and done, uh, you know, kind of thinking about the 2021 legislative agenda or even further beyond that, what would you like to see? Frank, you want to start us off on that? Yeah, I'll start off. And, uh, you know, I, I hate to do the kind of like I told you so sort of thing, because a lot of these are bills that I've been supporting for a long time, including five years ago when I served in the state Senate, when I, uh, when I introduced a, a variety of these things as a legislator at the time. But I think that there are a number of things that here in Ohio that we need to do. And then I'd like to talk briefly about the, the, the nation. Uh, we need to finally create online absentee ballot requests. It just doesn't fulfill the, the expectation that people have that you've got to fill out a, a dead tree piece of paper in 2020 and, and mail it in. We should have that online. Uh, we should have multiple early voting centers in each county in Ohio. That's laid out in law as only one location per county. That's something that I've said for a long time. We should have more uh, early voting centers uh, than one per county. And again, along with that, uh, I'd certainly be open to the expansion of, uh, of secure uh, receptacles at, at uh, other locations. But again, that, that's something that really should be done in law and not just by executive fiat from the Secretary of State. I'd also like to see us create a more automated form of voter registration in the state of Ohio. And I'd like to see us in Ohio join the vast majority of other states and have a top-down voter registration system. Of course, the decentralized nature of our elections is wonderful, but it also brings challenges with it. And the fact that we've got 88 different county boards of elections with 88 different sets of fingers on 88 different keyboards doing the, the maintenance of their voter registration databases leads to problems with data entry, problems with database management, and, and a whole variety of other things. And so that top-down system would be a, a vast improvement and something I'd like to see uh, here in Ohio. Uh, so those are just a couple of the ideas I had. Now, one thing I'd like to see nationwide is that uh, I think it's time that we have another uh, thing like the, the, the presidential commission that the Obama administration uh, seated um, following the election where they put the, 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 the elections experts from the left and from the right together and they brought some other folks from around the country. And that set of recommendations included things like online voter registration, which we have here in Ohio and many other important changes. I think it's time that we that we take a, a nationwide look. Of course, it's up to the states to run elections, but there's some nationwide thinking that we need to do as far as how we improve elections in each of the 50 states. Great, it's a lot of good uh, food for thought there. Uh, Kathy, how about you? 
Yeah, so I guess at the state level, um, you know, you won't be surprised to hear pre-canvassing, allowing the counties to start pre-canvassing the ballots early would be, uh, I'll keep pushing for that for as long as I'm here because it's such an obvious win for the voters, for the Commonwealth, for the nation. Um, I also would like to see some poll worker uh, expansion of, uh, of ability for counties to fill those poll worker vacancies. We have had, We've had over 55,000 volunteers through just the Department of State website for people this year volunteering to be poll, volunteering to be poll workers. I hope that continues, but in Pennsylvania, we have very restrictive laws. You have to actually live in the district where you're serving as a poll worker. The county should be able to fill those positions with anybody in the county. So I want to make it easier for counties. I also, I think Frank, you just said this too. I would love to see the next, we've had a lot of great big changes in Pennsylvania. The next big one that I'd really like to see is automatic voter registration. And you know, this is something that we at the NAS conferences, um, when the secretaries of state have gotten together, we get together, you know, the partisan, partisan background is irrelevant. We get together and talk about what, what's working, what's, what's a great idea in our state. We share it with each other. Red, blue, purple alike. The secretaries of state that have implemented automatic voter registration talk about not only does it improve access for voters, but it also helps keep the voting the voting rolls cleaner because when a voter goes, you know, whatever to use some public service and they're updating their their address there, it's also getting updated on the voter rolls. So it's good across the board. At the federal level, my single biggest change that I really would love to see is sustained, continuing, predictable funding. I'm, I was very grateful for the CARES Act dollars, very grateful for the HAVA election security dollars, but we didn't know that they were coming until the last minute. And, and then of course, the amazing philanthropy that we saw late in the cycle this year has made it possible to run this election well. But we, it shouldn't come to that. We should know funding should be provided on elections by the federal government on a regular basis so that counties and states and whoever else is running elections knows that they can anticipate they're going to get this amount next year and this amount two years from now and therefore plan ahead. The way it's been done in the last year or two um, is you know, is, is not, does not allow for preparing ahead and really thinking about what's the next thing that I want to do. So I'll stop there, um, but those are my big ones. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jocelyn? Thanks, Miles. And certainly, uh, as my colleagues have underscored, there's a lot of different things that we can learn from this past cycle and improve upon. I think in that regard, so many of our election laws have been in various states, been done through piecemeal uh, projects and amendments, and we really need a comprehensive top to bottom review in Michigan and in many other states of our election law to move towards modernization of the process. Certainly having automatic voter registration in Michigan has been a great boon. Everything that Secretary Bookfar said we've seen in, in Michigan, but we need to do more uh, to build off of that and modernize our process. So a top to bottom bipartisan review of how to upgrade not just our election administration laws, but I always see voting in democracy, election administration is one of three uh, pillars. Uh, the other being independent redistricting, which we have in Michigan. In fact, right now, we have an independent citizens commission uh, that is going to be in conjunction with my office, uh, working to draw uh, district lines. That uh, independent commission uh, is important. And I'd like to see other states follow suit. Uh, and third, uh, let's not forget the need to address the role that money and politics plays uh, in impacting who has power and the messaging and education that voters receive uh, throughout the process. So I think comprehensive uh, voter uh, reform, democracy reform needs to proceed on all those levels, not just in Michigan, but across the country. And as Secretary Bookbar said, certainly sustained federal funding is something we've all been advocating for for uh, throughout this year, and, and I'm sure we'll continue to do so. I would emphasize that I also think the federal government has a critical role to play in setting standards and expectations for the state, uh, even if it's simply a floor of standards that we need to meet from a security standpoint, from a administration standpoint. Uh, the federal government has played that role in the past uh, through important legislation like the Help America Vote Act, the Not National Voter Registration Act, 
of course, the Voting Rights Act and so many others. Uh, and it can't abdicate that role in, in providing funding to the states. It also must uh, create uh, um, standards that, that states are, should be expected to meet in order to receive that funding. I want to just pick up quickly on that last point, and then I'll give you all your your concluding remarks. But um, uh, the, you know the 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 Election Assistance Commission was designed to be fairly weak, uh, not given very much authority. Um, do you think? And and I think I read recently that I think we may be the only country um, that doesn't have a national election authority with responsibilities for overseeing the elections you know, from a national perspective. You know, we've got a very, very decentralized, both from the federal to the states and also from the states to the counties and then sometimes the counties to the towns. Um, do you think a stronger election authority would make sense? I think Jocelyn, you sort of weighed in on that, but uh, Frank, how about you and Kathy? I guess I'll start. I mean, I think that we have a long history of preferring decentralized versus centralized authority in this country. And I think for good reason, um, I think that, as uh, Secretary Benson said, there's certainly an important role for the uh, for the federal government to play. I think that the Elections Assistance Commission does a good job. They've been great partners. I think DHS does a great job. We work often with DOJ as well. And so these are all things that are important. I think it's important for the federal government to set standards like the Voting Rights Act and, and for example, the Help America Vote Act, which is, as Secretary Benson mentioned, been a great success over the years. But really, the administration of elections needs to remain at the state level. Uh, that's where it's uh, best done. I think people trust it that way. Uh, and, and, and again, like states like, like ours, we really do it at the local level. It's 88 bipartisan county boards of elections where two Republicans and two Democrats come together every day and do this work. And when it feels like in, in Washington, Republicans and Democrats can't agree that today's Tuesday, at our 88 county boards of elections, we've got bipartisan teams doing the job on a daily basis and doing it quite well together. Great. Kathy, your thought on this? Yeah, you know, I think, um, you know, I think that CISA, the DHS is, you know, cyber security and infrastructure security agency has done a really good job at filling what was even a bigger gap before. I mean, EAC has some limited roles that they've played it. And EAC, I have to say, having just replaced every, you know, voting system in, in the state of Pennsylvania, and we did the certificate, Pennsylvania law requires state certification and federal certification. And we in Pennsylvania ended up implementing more stringent security and accessibility standards at state level than is even required at the federal level. So I think EAC has done a great job in certain limited realms, but I think CISA has been a, a, a really important addition in the election security front. Um, and I'd like to see that expand. I mean, even just in the two and a half years that I've been with the administration here, um, the federal, state and local partnerships have just expanded tremendously. I would like to see it expand even more. And, you know, I think particularly the communications, the more, you know, the more that we have confidence that information sharing is strong, that resources sharing is strong, and that that CISA, that the folks at CISA not only have the information, but have the ability to support both local and state jurisdictions as needed is critical. And again, that gets back to the issue of continuing sustained funding as well. Um, but I would like to see that what's now been expanded on election security to be more along the lines of what you were talking about, where it's it's not just election security, it's election modernization, it's 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 effective election administration across the board and sharing information on and ways to help some states model what's working well and help other states kind of lead um, you know, to gain those experiences and, and move their own states ahead. So yes, Miles, that's a long answer to your question, which is I think we should have more infrastructure at the federal level to help lead, help lead us to a better place, a stronger place for all voters across the country. Great. All right, before I give you your last minute, and I, I did say we'd leave you at, get you off at five o'clock and we're just, uh, we're at that witching hour. Uh, we will send, a, send all of you, the panelists, the list of questions. There are a number of questions that are individually directed to your states. If you wanna take the time or someone on your staff wants to take the time to try to address them, I don't want people to feel like they were frustrated because they asked a specific question about barcoding in Pennsylvania, but didn't get an answer. But uh, if you're willing to do that, that would be great. Um, all right, so what is your, uh, um, and I wanna thank the audience for being uh, patient and, uh, and, uh, and energetic in the questions and 
stay tuned for the other ASH events. But I want to give each of the three of you a chance to say your um, uh, your concluding remark. What is what is it that you want to leave people uh, from today? Uh, Frank, how about you? Well, thank you, Miles. And for anybody that wants to continue the conversation, I, I welcome that uh, on social media as well. Find me at just at Frank LaRose on all the different platforms. Um, I was uh, blessed to come into this office a year and a half ago in a state that was really well prepared for the pandemic really long before we were ever talking about it. Ohio fielded $115 million worth of new elections equipment all throughout the state, the most state of the art and secure equipment available two years ago. I worked on that bill in the legislature. We've had for a long time, uh, one of the most permissive and convenient set of options in the country for early voting, for absentee voting, and of course for election day voting. Ohioans are proud of that. We lead the nation in many regards with 216 hours of early voting. In fact, every day from now until election day, Ohioans can vote in person, including Saturday and Sunday. We're one of a few states that makes that available. And the Brookings Institution, as I said, it ranked our, our absentee voting program among the top in the nation. That's something that I was proud of as well. And of course, we've worked to make sure that we're ready for the uh, specific issues that have come up as a result of the pandemic. And that uh, is something that we're proud of here in Ohio and we're ready to go for, for this election. And it'll be a fair and honest contest. I guess here's what it comes down to. It's the, the basic belief that uh, as Lincoln said, the election belongs to the people. Uh, we're the caretakers of it. We are the, the, uh, uh, the custodians of that sacred trust right now. I, I know that uh, Secretary Buckbar has the, the picture of the bridge on her desk. I see it. I know Jocelyn has one as well because the three of us were there together. You see mine back here, uh, that bridge that hopefully is renamed the John Lewis Bridge here one day soon as it should be. But um, on that bridge just over 55 years ago, people had to fight for and in some cases bleed for the right that, um, uh, that we know is so precious. And we now as secretaries are safeguarding that right and we have a responsibility to do that. Uh, but we also live in a time where it's easier to vote than it's ever been before. At least that's the case in Ohio. And it's important for people to take that right and that responsibility seriously and to make their voice heard. And I believe that Ohioans are going to do that in record numbers. And I believe that I'm going to beat Jocelyn Benson when it comes to our, our bet that we have because Ohioans are going to show up in uh, record numbers to, to vote this year. But when this is over, uh, people will know it was an honest contest and, and we're not getting distracted by all the noise out there. And I hope that voters aren't either. It's important to keep it simple. Make your vote. Uh, make your voice heard and cast your vote. Great. Jocelyn, I think he tossed the ball to you with that uh, last comment. As he often does. Yes, we're, we've got a healthy competitive friendship and rivalry here in Michigan and Ohio. And I'm looking forward to, I mean, I don't know, Frank, every step of the way as we've tracked the number of people requesting to vote early in our states, Michigan's been ahead of Ohio and we're still ahead of you guys now crossing 3 million today. So good luck. I uh, will see you on the other side and uh, look forward to hearing you sing the Michigan fight song at the Ohio State Michigan football game this fall. I will just also say, um, look, this has been a challenging cycle, unlike none other. But let's not forget that this is a beautiful thing, democracy, and certainly a healthy democracy requires an engaged and informed citizenry. And really the silver lining that makes me so optimistic this year and so hopeful for our future is that we are seeing citizens in record numbers be engaged and informed despite historic levels uh, to, of, of partisan uh, aligned misinformation uh, to try to deter citizens from voting, to try to sow seeds of doubt about the faith, their faith in their process to try to um, drum up chaos and confusion about the voting process itself. In every step of the way, the numbers are already showing. Citizens are rising up and demanding to have their votes counted and their voice heard. And that's a beautiful thing that ultimately I believe will be the story of this year's election. Despite every, everything, even a global pandemic, people voted and people turned out to vote and every step of the way, secretaries of state like the three of us worked to ensure that the pathways were clear, that voters were protected, that every vote counted and every voice was heard. Wonderful, thank you. Kathy? Yeah, so, you know, I think my fundamental message is don't believe the hype. Don't, don't believe the disinformation out there and don't let the headlines get you down. I mean, honestly, there's so many skies falling headlines every day that are just not reflecting the reality in our towns, in our counties, in our states. And, you know, I see, I see every day I talk to county election officials, I talk to county commissioners, and I can tell you that these, these locations are more prepared 
despite all the change, despite that we're in a global pandemic, despite we have new voting systems, despite we have Act 77 that provides more voting options to voters in Pennsylvania than ever before, despite all of this, our counties and our officials are better prepared than these they've ever been. I get emails and texts and communications from voters all the time who are raving about the early voting experiences that they're having. It's really been incredible, but what it takes ultimately to get through from here till the last ballots are counted, our faith, faith in our election officials, faith in our leaders that were that are in on the ground running these elections, counting those ballots. They have been doing this for a long time and they are really dedicated and really good at it. Got to trust, trust them, of course vote, and then have some patience. As we talked about earlier, Miles, this is gonna take a little, like when you have 10 times as many mail-in ballots, it takes longer to count. Have faith in the process, have patience in those results, and make sure that no matter what you vote, no matter how you vote, every method is safe, secure, and accessible. Make sure you exercise your vote, your voice, make sure you're heard this November. And I agree with Jocelyn, democracy is beautiful. It's sometimes messy, but it's ultimately beautiful. Get out the vote. Thank you. All right. Well, I really want to thank all three of you. I think we lost Jocelyn, but uh, to, to the two of you, thank you for taking the time on what is clearly, clearly busy, a busy, very busy time. I think this was great. And I'm going to end with a prediction. In uh, 2016, 137 million people voted. Uh, I believe that this election will go over 155, maybe close to 160 million people. And I think that's in part because of all the changes and in part because of the great work all of you are doing. So thanks for being with us today, but thanks even more so for the work that you're doing for our democracy. Much, much appreciated.